Um, first thing, let's talk about the skull, okay, because that's important so we understand where these aneurysms are. We have the scalp. Underneath the scalp, we have the galea, which is a cat the inner sort of firm layer of the scalp with connective tissue. Underneath that's the subgalial space. Between the galea, beneath the galea is the bone. Underneath the bone is the epidural space. It's because it's above the dura matter. Then we run into the dura mater, which is the sac-like color of the brain. Then beneath that's the subdural space. Beneath that's the arachnoid, which is the thin, lacy covering of the brain. Underneath the arachnoid, between the arachnoid and the brain tissue itself, is the subarachnoid space. Okay? And then beneath the subarachnoid space is the pia mater, which is the actual um, covering of the brain itself that uh, cannot be peeled off the brain without damaging it, whereas the subarachnoid, the arachnoid, is a membrane that surrounds the brain and can be opened up and, and contains fluid. Then there's the brain parenchyma, the brain tissue, and then there's the <coughs> ventricles. Okay? So where we're what we're going to talk about is is lesion, lesions, aneurysms that are located in this space, below the arachnoid and above the pia mater. Here's the normal vasculature of the brain. I know you've seen this in the other talks, but here we have the inter this is the right side, the left side, because we're looking at the person. So eyeball would be here, right eyeball, left eyeball would be right here. Dye is injected up the internal carotid artery, comes up, this is the part of the brain. It branches into the middle cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery, and then it branches, it continues to anterior cerebral artery, they keep branching and branching, middle cerebral artery keeps branching and branching. Here I told you before about how there's collateral blood flow, now blood can be injected up the right side, but supply the left side. Here it's injected up the right side, comes across to the anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery on the right, then it comes across this, which is the anterior communicating artery, to fill the left anterior cerebral artery, even though we're injecting up the right, the left middle cerebral artery, and even some of it's going down the opposite internal carotid artery. Even though there's blood coming up like this, we're injecting under pressure, so we're actually able to overcome temporarily the blood flow coming up here and force dye down the opposite direction, okay? And this is what's called the circle of Willis, or the anterior part of the circle of Willis. And we, you know, we were constructed so that we, we could try to get blood to the brain in as many routes as possible. Then this is the back of the brain. This is the vertebral artery, comes up the neck, comes up, joins the other vertebral artery from the left side, forms the basilar artery. Basilar artery comes up, branches into the superior cerebellar arteries here and here, comes up more posterior cerebral arteries here and here. So you can see that there's the anterior circulation and this is called the posterior circulation. And here's an example of an aneurysm that has formed at the anterior cerebral artery. You can kind of get a little bit of a view of it here. This is dark, dark expanded area here. But here we've, we've taken a, a different view of this. We've taken this, this view and kind of aimed in an angled direction towards this. And now you can see here's the middle cerebral artery. Here's the internal carotid artery here. The middle cerebral artery here. The anterior cerebral artery here, okay? The anterior cerebral artery comes up here, then goes up here. But right where it's turning, the sac is formed, okay? And that's an aneurysm. Okay. So the subarachnoid space contains the larger cerebral arteries uh, prior to them branching to penetrate into the brain itself to give them blood flow. The areas that they penetrate are called the Ver Verkau Robanic spaces. And all of these spaces, the subarachnoid space, contains cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. So when blood vessels tear or rupture, at an aneurysm. They release blood into the subarachnoid space. That's why it's called a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And it mixes with the spinal fluid. Occasionally, the blood can also go into the brain tissue itself, about 20 to 40 percent of the time. That's because the aneurysms, even though they're not in the brain tissue, they're laying on top of the brain. And just like anything under high pressure, if you cut a hole in it, the blood can just spurt out and can cut into the brain 
dissect it to the brain, you can get a blood clot in the brain as well. You can also extend blow even further deep into the brain and go into the, the ventricles, okay, into the ventricular space, which are the fluid-filled space of the brain, or just by filling the subarachnoid fluid, which comes from the ventricle, blood can wash into the ventricles. And that happens in up to 30% of cases. And even can even go into the subdural space. So if you have an aneurysm, the aneurysm can be so strong, it can rupture or be in such a location where it ruptures into the brain itself and then ruptures through the brain, okay, through the arachnoid and into the subdural space, okay? But in general, most aneurysms rupture just into the subarachnoid space and then you might see blood in the ventricles as well as, as it mixes with the spinal fluid. Okay, what's the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage? Even though we're here talking about aneurysms, the most common cause is trauma, so a head injury. You have a head injury, little blood vessels in the subarachnoid space tear, and you have bleeding there. But patients that come in with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage have no history of trauma. They may have fallen and hit their head, and then it might be hard to figure out whether this is a traumatic bleed or an aneurysmal bleed, but usually they'll have a history of having had something happen or, or express some feeling and then fall in and hit their head. So they passed out, hit their head as opposed to hit their head accidentally or from a motor vehicle accident. Um, uh, spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage is, uh, can happen for other reasons than aneurysms, but 75 to 85 percent if we get rid of trauma is aneurysmal. Um, and these aneurysms can be congenital, you're born with them. Um, they're, that's rare, that's why children can be born with aneurysms or they can be from birth trauma. Um, they can be traumatic, so a, a knife wound to the head or a gunshot wound to the head can injure a blood vessel, cause an aneurysm to develop. They can be mycotic or infectious. Um, you can get an, an infection from the heart that travels to the, or the sinuses, or that travels to the, the blood vessels that are in the wall of blood vessels. Okay, it's called the vasovasorum. Blood vessels need blood supply to live also because they're tissue. Blood, so uh, bacteria or, or uh, fungi can travel up through the circulation into the wall of the blood vessel and infect the blood vessels that supply blood to the blood vessels. And that can weaken the blood vessel. The blood vessel can then become aneurysmal. Um, they can be flow-related where they're areas that have high flow or turbulent flow develop an aneurysm, and that's what most aneurysms that we're going to talk about today are from. Um, and they can be dissected. They can be from an injury to the um, wall of the artery. And we, I, in the last sessions, we talk, not today, but the other week, we talked about how the blood vessels are like a, um, uh, a steel belted tire. It's got multiple layers. If we tear the inner layer of that, we can get blood traveling between the two layers. And that blood going between the two layers of the lining of the blood vessel can cause areas to expand, and that's called a dissecting aneurysm. There are other causes of subarachnoid hemorrhage, arteriovenous malformations, uh, which are tangles of blood vessels. I showed them um, two weeks ago. Um, they can bleed. Um, usually when they, when they present with subarachnoid hemorrhage, that's because there's an aneurysm associated with them, and then the aneurysm bled. If there's blood in the brain, it's because the, usually it's because the AVM itself bled, because the AVMs are located within brain tissue, the aneurysms, unless they're in the center of the AVM, the aneurysms that are on the blood vessels leading to the AVM are in the subarachnoid space. The reason those aneurysms form are because of the high flow. There's so much flow going to the AVM that the vessels proximal to the AVM that are feeding it are under so much stress that they weaken and develop an aneurysm. You can have vasculitis or vasculopathy, infection, um, autoimmune disease that causes weakening of the vessels. We talked about dissections. You can have you can have a subarachnoid hemorrhage just for a small vessel just tearing for no reason. Um, those generally happen in a certain area on an MRI and CT scan called the basilar cisterns. Uh, and they're called benign carrying mesencephalic hemorrhages. They, nobody knows what causes them. It's probably small veins or arteries tear. Generally never happens again. And people do well for them. You can have a subarachnoid hemorrhage from a coagulopathy. Someone has too much anticoagulation on board. We're always tearing vessels. I mean, there are vessels in us that are tearing right now, but our body just quickly shuts it down small vessels, but if you're fully anticoagulated or over anticoagulated, your body can't stop that, so you bleed, and the body's platelets and fiber system can't stop that bleeding, and you present with, with uh, bleeding in the brain. Um, spinal ABMs, you can have an ABM 
in the spinal cord bleed, go into the subarachnoid space, and that blood can then travel up to the head through the CSF spaces and look like subarachnoid hemorrhage from the brain, but it's really from the spinal cord. Uh, certain drugs can cause infections or weakening of blood vessels, especially uh, cocaine. It's not the cocaine itself, it's the additives that are put in the cocaine or amphetamines. Sickle cell disease, the, va you know, the, the vasovasorum of the blood vessels get clogged up by the sickle cells, and that can cause weakening of the blood vessel as the blood vessel wall dies. Um, pituitary apoplexy can cause subarachnoid hemorrhage. The pituitary gland can grow so quickly from a tumor that it outstrips its blood supply. The tumor can't get enough blood, and it hemorrhages at basically it's a stroke of the pituitary gland. And, and it hemorrhages, and where the pituitary gland is located is in the subarachnoid, is, is, is right next to the subarachnoid space, and it can bleed into that area. Um, we talked about the benign perimesencephalic hemorrhage. That's when the little veins just tear on their own. And then unknown etiology, about 14 to 22 percent of people that, that present with a subarachnoid hemorrhage, we never figure out why it happened. The good news is, if you rule everything else out, the chances, number one, they do well from it, except they have a bad headache, but they generally do fine. Um, and there's less than one percent chance it'll ever happen again. Okay, what's the definition of an aneurysm? It's a dilatation of an intracranial artery. Um, they can be saccular, bury aneurysms, which are more common. Saccular is like what I showed you before. There's a vessel coming up at a branch point or a turn point, a little sac forms. It looks like a little barrier that you can pluck off. There are also fusiform aneurysms where an aneurysm comes up. Think of that more like an aortic aneurysm, where the, the aorta comes down and then dilates and then gets normal again. You can get those in the intracranially as well, less commonly. Um, the uh, saccular aneurysms, you're going to hear us talking today about the, the opening, which is the neck. That's the place where the aneurysm arises from the blood vessel. That's called the neck of the aneurysm. And then there's the fundus, which is the sac, the body of the aneurysm. And the reason that's important is we're going to talk about the fundus to neck ratios. And you're going to hear that term where we measure the body of the aneurysm, the sac, and we measure the neck of the aneurysm, and we divide, the, divide them. Okay, as a ratio. And the reason this is important is the, the higher this ratio, in general, the better a candidate it is for treatment with coils endovascularly. And about 85% of aneurysms nowadays are treated by going up through the groin with catheters and coils as opposed to having to open somebody's head. But what we do and how complicated doing that is, most commonly, is due to what this ratio is. The lower this ratio, the higher this ratio, I'm sorry, the easier it is to treat the aneurysm. You'll hear the term giant aneurysm. A lot of people call aneurysms giant that are not giant. A true giant aneurysm is big. It's bigger than 25 millimeters. And, if you, and while that may seem small, your eyeball is about 30 millimeters. So this is something that's almost as big as your eyeball. Um, maybe you see one a year, giant aneurysms, um, at a, even at a busy center. Um, some these giant aneurysms are important because they sometimes they may not present from rupture. They may present just because they're a mass in the head, and they start pushing on important structures. Um, and I told you about wide neck aneurysms being defined as the fundus to the neck ratio, the body divided by the opening, um, less than two. Okay, so you would like the body of the aneurysm, the sac, to be twice as big as the opening to make it as easy as possible to treat. Um, or if the neck is bigger than four millimeters in general, no matter what the, the fundus is. Okay, so here's, a, here's an example of a mycotic aneurysm. Before I showed you an aneurysm that was located right here, okay? Typical places located are here, 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 branch points. Um, but here we see an aneurysm out here. Okay, on a very small blood vessel. Way, I mean, blood had to go out here, 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 here to get here. That's how you have to get there. The, this is caused by an infection. The wall of the blood vessel got infected and got blistered. The reason these are important are two reasons. Number one, they have a very high incidence of bleeding. They have a high incidence of re-bleeding once they've bled once. And they are gonna get bigger and bigger unless they're treated. And the treatment is twofold. One is to treat with antibiotics. And the second thing is, if it's bled, get rid of it by, by, with catheters and coils. If it hasn't bled, you, you might choose just to treat with antibiotics and 
and follow it, and a week later do another arteriogram and see if it's gone or getting smaller. If it's changing in size and getting larger, you need to treat it because it's got a high likelihood that it's going to, that it's going to go on to, to rupture. And the other important thing is you've got to find the source. If somebody has this, where did the bacteria come from? Most commonly, it comes from either an, like a, tooth in, a dental infection, a sinus infection, or an uh, infection of the heart, um, endocarditis, uh, or val you know, valvular disease. And that needs to be treated as well. A lot of these patients will, will need valve replacements um, in order to uh, uh, not develop any more of these. They also need follow-up because just because you see one now doesn't mean another one's not in the process of forming. So you need follow-up studies um, you know, a month later, three months later to make sure even though you got rid of this one, other ones didn't develop. Do you find that, I'm sorry, do you find that, that when you get them in the smaller vessels like that, it tends to be more related to infection than to infection? Yeah, and so this is like pathognomonic. If you see an aneurysm like that, it's either, until proven otherwise, it's either infectious or it's if there's a history of trauma. So you might see an aneurysm here from a gunshot or a knife wound to the head, but um, short of trauma, that's an infectious aneurysm. And talking about that, here's a uh, here's a traumatic gunshot wound. Okay, here's a um, here's the pellet. Okay, Sorry. and here's the aneurysm right here. Okay, um, this is a saccular aneurysm we talked about. These are the ones we're really be talking about today. The ones that are most commonly seen. Here you see the basilar artery coming up. Here's the top. This wasn't, you know, usually it came up here and just branched into a vessel here and a vessel here. But here, this big sac has formed. Okay? Here you can see after we've treated it, this is what it should look, the vessel should look like. This here is this coil mass here that's in the aneurysm. Okay? And I'll, sh I'll show you treatment later when we get to the video. So, what causes aneurysms to develop? Well, the intracranial aneurysm, the intracranial arteries are very fragile. They have, unlike the aorta or the arteries of the, of the peripheries, in the peripheral um, uh, parts of your body, they have much less muscle, less elastic protein, the walls are thinner, um, and therefore they're weaker. So they, they, but they see a lot of blood flow. 30% of our blood flow goes to our brain with every heartbeat. And there are a lot of branch points, and at branch points the flow becomes very turbulent. So even though they're very, they're very thin and fragile, um, they go through a tremendous amount of wear and tear over a lifetime. Um, and they have less supporting tissue around them. You know, they're not buried in muscle. They're, they're, they're free floating in the subarachnoid space. There may be brain around them, folded around them, but that brain is not really pushing on the blood vessels a lot. And so they, again, they are expanding more with each pulsation and they don't have a whole lot of support from the outside um, to buffer that, um, that turbulence and, and uh, and flow. Um, they, it often occurs with bifurcations, where the, the aneurysms form with bifurcations. That's basically where the arteries branch, because that's where the flow is most turbulent. You see water going down a river, where it branches, the shore right at the crotch is, is you see all the, all the water rushing around there. Because it's going down, it's hitting it, it's going in eddies, and then it's going the direction. There's a lot of stress right at that point. Um, we talked about infection. Uh, we talked about uh, traumatic destruction of the arterial wall. We talked about uh, spontaneous hemorrhage. But, um, the, this, is why aneur this is why most aneurysms, saccular aneurysms, develop where they do. Um, how common are they? 5% of people, if you look at autopsy studies, 5% of everybody having an autopsy will have an aneurysm. So the chances are somebody in this room has an aneurysm, okay? Or if somebody in this room doesn't, then if we were all in the next door, two of those people might have one. Um, they are not all symptomatic, though. Okay, there are a lot of people that go through their whole life with aneurysms and never have a symptom from it, and therefore don't know they have it. 20% uh, of people that have one aneurysm have another aneurysm. So if you have an aneurysm, you have a 20% chance of having more than one. Um, the rate of um, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage is 6 to 8 per 100,000. So that you can see that while 5% of the population has an aneurysm, one out of every 20, okay, only six to eight out of 100,000 will actually rupture, okay, per year. So, so you're more likely than not not to rupture if you have an aneurysm in your head. The peak age of rupture is um, between ages 55 and 60, um, and women are about two-thirds, 
than men are one third in terms of ruptured aneurysms and aneurysms in general. Why? Nobody knows. Um, approximately half of all aneurysms will will eventually rupture. As I told you, it's rare in children. Uh, two, only two percent occur in children. They can be traumatic, and it's not traumatic from a, a bad delivery. It's traumatic from um, if it happens to be a traumatic delivery. It's a hard delivery. There are there's, there are dural folds in the brain, and sometimes the arteries can can strike those folds and be injured during a delivery, having nothing to do with the delivery method itself. And the aneurysm can be the artery can be weakened. And again, they also can occur with AVMs and with uh, generalized trauma, gunshot wounds, and uh, and uh, knife wounds. Um, what are the risk factors for aneurysms? So, so what things may make you put you at higher risk than the regular population of having an aneurysm? Polycystic kidney disease, 15% of those people have aneurysms. It's a connective tissue disorder. Um, fibromuscular dysplasia, another connective tissue disorder. So if you have connective tissue disorder somewhere, the collagens can be abnormal elsewhere, it can be abnormal in the brain, in the brain vessels. Um, uh, renal fibromuscular dysplasia, 7% uh, of those patients that have renal arteries with fibromuscular dysplasia will also have um, aneurysms. Um, about 21% of people with aortocranial um, fibromuscular dysplasia, so you see uh, fibromuscular dysplasia of the aorta and of the um, blood vessels in the neck, okay, 21% of them have a chance of developing an aneurysm. We talked about AVMs, arteriovenous malformations, because of the turbulent flow. Can have aneurysms both within the AVM itself and on vessels that feed the AVM. Uh, Moya Moya disease, which is a, a, probably an auto, autoimmune or viral type of illness that causes the vasculopathy, can have aneurysms. We talked about connective tissue disorders, um, Ehlers Danlos, especially, which is a collagen disorder. Um, Marfan syndrome, we've all heard of, which is a connective disorder, tissue disorder. Familial aneurysms. If you've got two or more uh, members of your family that, that are within thir three degrees of you, so a mother, an aunt, a sister, um, or the same thing with you know, brothers and uncles, but you have an increased risk of having an aneurysm. Um, Coarctation of the order, also we have a rondu, atherosclerotic disease, we talk about endocarditis and mycotic aneurysm and smoking. Okay, the, um, in smoking has been shown to be a clear, a clear risk factor um, reversible risk factor only in women, not in men, but prob that's probably because the study wasn't powered enough to look for men, because women are more likely to develop aneurysms anyway. Um, um, but, uh, uh, and the reason probably is that nicotine has in it all these um, substances called elastases that break down the elastin of the arteries. And that's how it damages all of our arteries, but can cause damage to the blood vessels of the brain. What's the natural history of an aneurysm? So now I, I told you 5% of us can have an aneurysm. What happens if we do have one? Well, in, in, in Japan, um, they looked at, uh, at patients with aneurysms, 91% of which were discovered incidentally. So these pe there aren't patients that, that presented with subarachnoid hemorrhage. And they said, well, what happens uh, to people with these unruptured aneurysms? Um, the overall rupture rate is about a little less than 1% per year. Okay, but that's cumulative. So we do it from the time of discovery. So roughly if you have 20 more years of life in you and, you, and we find you have an aneurysm at the age of 60 and we look at insurance tables and it says, well, you probably should live to be 80, um, you have, it's not 20 times 1%, because that's not the way the math works, but you probably have about a 15% chance of your aneurysm bleeding over those next 20 years. I tell people that every, with an aneurysm that every 10 years they have about an 8% chance of their aneurysm bleeding. Okay? And that's important because people come in and we have to make a judgment as to whether or not we want to treat them or not. And they have to decide if they want to be treated. And that's balanced from what the risks are of bleeding versus the risks of treating them. Um, the uh, mortality is 35%. So if it bleeds, you have, you've got a 35% chance you're going to die. Uh, and major morbidity, so I tell people overall, is, is another 30%. So what I tell people is, look, if you have an aneurysm and it bleeds on you, you have a 60% chance, and what I tell them is, of, of either dying or making life not worth living. Okay? So that's what people are looking at on the downside of not treating. Then what they also want to look at, well, how many years do I have to live? So if I'm 89 years old, I don't care that I got a 60% chance of this aneurysm killing me and making life not worth living. I've only got 
a half a percent chance that it's going to bleed over my lifetime, or one percent chance. Of course, I'm not going to treat that because the risk of treating it's probably three percent. So the risk of treating it's greater than the risk of leaving it alone in that person. But if you're 60, it becomes a little bit harder decision. Certainly, if you're if you're under 60, it becomes pretty obvious that you probably should have this treated. Um, the risk factors we talked about being a female, being over 70, location, the anterior communicating artery, the posterior communicating artery, um, and the uh, uh, has a higher risk of hemorrhage than other areas. Um, if you have high blood pressure, you have a higher risk. If you have hyperlipidemia, you have a higher risk. Um, if you have a, uh, a daughter sac, so if on that aneurysm there's another protuberance, so it's very irregular, we believe you have a higher risk. Um, um, increasing size, the bigger the aneurysm, the higher risk there is of it bleeding. The average aneurysm is about five millimeters in size. And you can see these hazard ratios, which are the risks of bleeding, go up as the size goes up. So as the size goes up, if you're greater than 25 millimeters, the hazard ratio is 76% higher. So the risk of this aneurysm bleeding is 76 times more than of this aneurysm bleeding. Okay? If there's calcification in the wall of the aneurysm, it's a higher risk of uh, bleeding, we think, and smoking. Um, we talked about presence of other aneurysms as well. So, um, and then of course an aneurysm that is, has ruptured previously has a higher risk of re-bleeding, of re especially in the first year or the first six months after it bled. Um, if there are, you have another aneurysm elsewhere, you have a higher risk of bleeding. If it's located in the posterior circulation, the basilar artery, you have a higher risk of bleeding. And again, if it's, if it's greater than seven, seven millimeters, here it's almost equivalent, 1.1, so a six millimeter is only a little over, a little over baseline of three, of three to four millimeters. But once you get up to here, now you see an aneurysm with a three and a half times higher risk of bleeding than this aneurysm. Okay, everybody with me so far? Okay. Um, annual rate of rupture according to size and location. So we can look at this, if somebody has, here's the critical size, of the we do treat aneurysms that are smaller, but if we want to talk about where, where the risks compared to a smaller aneurysm really start to jump, it's at seven to nine millimeters. And you can see that ACOM is almost two times higher risk of bleeding than if you take vertebral junction pica, which is a certain location, as a baseline, which has a very low risk of bleeding, Okay? This aneurysm has almost a two times greater risk of this, of bleeding. This aneurysm has, has a three times greater risk of bleeding than this. So there are certain locations that we can say in somebody who's older, you know what, you really should have this treated because even though it's the same size as your friend's, yours is in a more dangerous location. We talked about risk factors, hypertension, oral contraceptive use, cigarette use, cocaine use, alcohol, pregnancy, advanced age. The only thing that's, that's clearly been proven to be directly associated with aneurysms, statistically, is cigarette use. But all of these um, are correlated with, with uh, rupture. What are the symptoms? Symptoms. 97% of people will have the worst headache of their life. It's called a thunderclap headache. Now, that doesn't mean that, that if you don't have a thunderclap headache, you didn't have an aneurysm bleed. But if you did have a thunderclap headache, that's a very, you have a 97% chance that it's an aneurysmal bleed. Um, they can also have emesis from the increased intracranial pressure and the pain, loss of consciousness from the increased intracranial pressure. When the aneurysm bleeds, arterial blood comes out into the, into the skull, ICP goes up, blood flow to the brain goes down because the, the blood can't get up there because the pressure is so high in the brain and you pass out because you don't have enough blood to your brain. Photophobia, aversion to light, that's from the irrit irritation of the blood on the, on the, on the brain covering. Some people have a sentinel hemorrhage, 30 to 60 percent will present prior to this thunderclap headache. You know, you'll, you'll get to talk to them and you get to talk to the family and say, you know what, uh, my wife had a, had a kind of a bad headache last week, but it, it went away or it was really been low grade the last week. She went to her doctor, he said it was sinusitis, gave her some antibiotics, now she presents. Sentinel headache is either a very small leak that caused some irritation but didn't cause them to pass out. Or the aneurysm, or they didn't leak blood, but the aneurysm is suddenly enlarged in size because these blood vessels are innervated with pain with fibers. So if it went suddenly from five millimeters in size to six millimeters in size, that stretching of the wall can cause severe, severe pain. Um, so we want to be very wary of people. That, and I, I do a lot of expert witness stuff, and there are 
one of the one of the biggest things is the patient that came to the doctor or the ER with a headache was sent home without a CT scan, without considering subarachnoid hemorrhage. May even then present again a week later, saying, "You know what? I, I feel worse. My headache's not going away." And they say, "Oh, you know, keep taking the antibiotics or, or something else." Then the third time they they present with a rupture. So you have to be very suspicious of anybody with a severe headache and rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is fairly easy to do between a CT scan and a lumbar puncture. You can tell within a couple hours whether somebody has had a bleed or not. Sudden enlargement, you can't really tell without imaging. So if the story is good enough, then you go on to arteriography. Um, so these are the symptoms, okay, what the person complains about. These are the signs. This is what you might see on exam. Uh, a focal cranial nerve palsy, usually a third nerve palsy, and that's because of where the third nerve is located in relation to the posterior communicating artery and the superior cerebellar artery. When aneurysms form at, at those, on those arteries, the third nerve travels right near them. That aneurysm pushes on that nerve and causes the third nerve not to function. So they can get a, they can get a droopy eye, an eye that doesn't move, their pupil can become fixed and dilated. You have to kind of differentiate that from a diabetic pupil, um, but uh, it is something you want to think about when somebody has a third nerve palsy. Neck stiffness from the blood products irritate the meninges and make the neck hurt when you move it. Obviously coma. Um, ocular hemorrhage, the pressure can, can, uh, can go up. Central retinal artery can get, uh, central, I'm sorry, the central retinal vein can get occluded. The pressure goes up and now it can't drain the blood. Blood can't drain out of the eye and you get venous hypertension and ruptures in the eye. Those are called vitreous hemorrhages. Um, you can get uh, a, a ret hemorrhages anywhere, either pre-retinal, in the retina, or in the vitreous, which is called Tursen's hemorrhages. And up to 27% of people actually hemorrhage into the fluid of their eye if you examine them with an ophthalmoscope. And the reason that's important is some people will say, I can't see, or I, I can see really poorly. I've seen people come in blind from it. The important thing is that usually goes away over time as that those blood products break down. If it doesn't go away over about four months, then the ophthalmologist goes in and can drain the fluid out with a needle, replace it, and um, the vision comes back. But you want to get that blood out if it doesn't go away on its own because it can cause scarring. Okay, how do we uh, classify these patients? We, we've gone through classification scores for head injury so far, for coma, for stroke. Now we have a, a one for um, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And we use the Hunt and Hess. There's two. There's the Hunt and Hess of the World Federation. Most people in the United States use the Hunt and Hess. And it's, uh, it runs from zero to five. Zero is you have an aneurysm that never that didn't bleed. Okay? So you may have a headache, sentinel, head, sentinel, hem, sentinel headache from the aneurysm enlarging. You come in, you get a study. That person is Hunt and Hess grade zero. Um, a one is somebody that has a mild headache little nuchal rigidity. A two is somebody that's got a severe headache, okay, and nuchal rigidity, nuchal pain, neck pain. Three is somebody with a mild focal deficit, so they may have a little bit of weakness, but they're lethargically confused, okay. A four, they've got a severe neurologic deficit or they're in stupor. Um, and a five is somebody who's stuporous, comatose, and you could also go by their, by their reflex. And so a four, they might have decorticate posturing where they bring their arms up to central pain, and a five, they have decerebrate posture where they bring their arms down. Zero, one, or two, well, well, zero is unruptured. One or two is considered a low-grade hemorrhage. Four and five is a high-grade. Three is right in the middle. The greater your grade, the worse your outcome from treatment or, or from no treatment. That's why we, we want to fix people, if we can, that should be fixed before they rupture. Because you'll see, as, once they rupture, their, their functional survival goes down um, as the grade gets worse. Okay, Hunt and Hess score is because of this. Why? It, well, the, the Hunt and Hess score and hydrocephalus. So the Hunt and Hess score can be related to hydrocephalus. The more, if you bleed more, or you have a lot of blood in your head, and the Hunt and Hess score doesn't necessarily correlate to how much blood there is in your head, but from the bleeding in your head, the, the bottom line from this slide is that that CSF can now block the ability for spinal fluid to get reabsorbed by the arachnoid granulations, which are come from our venous sinuses, sit in, subarach sit in the subarachnoid space, reabsorb spinal fluid, put it into the venous blood, and then you, you know, it goes out in your urine. 
but you keep making spinal fluid. So if you're not reabsorbing it and you keep making it at 0.3 cc's a minute, it's like filling up a sink without with some stuff in the drain. Okay, you get some gunk in the drain, it starts filling up. And then you get hydrocephalus, the fluid filled spaces get bigger. It's one of the reasons why people with subarachnoid hemorrhage can present stuporous, confused, because they have hydrocephalus as well. Theoretically, the Hunt and Hess score is, done, is taken on a patient who does not have hydrocephalus. So if somebody comes in a grade four, so they're, they're almost comatose, or a grade five, let's say they're comatose, get a CT scan, if they're intubated, get a CT scan, they have hydrocephalus, you put a ventriculostomy in, um, drain the fluid out, then you get their score. You want to know what their score is without hydrocephalus, and that's their true Hunt and Hess score. Okay? Okay, what's the natural history of aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage? 10 to 15% of people die before they ever get to a hospital. 10% die no matter what you do within several days of reaching a hospital, whether you treat them with a coiling or don't treat them. They, they, they die either from the initial effects of the bleed or they die from re-bleeding if they're not treated. Overall mortality is between 32 and 67%, and 30% of survivors have a significant disability. That's why I said before, I tell people if they have an aneurysm that's unruptured, that's done. If, it's, if it ruptures, you have a 60 to 70 percent chance of, of uh, being disabled or living, having a life that's not worth living. How do we evaluate people? The first thing they do, they come in, we suspect that we get a CT scan. It's going to, de it's going to detect blood in greater than 95 percent of cases, modern CT scanning, within 48 hours of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and we look for large ventricles, which can be a sign that there's blood blocking things. You may not see a lot of blood, but you may see the ventricles are enlarged. That's a sign. You may see blood pooling in certain areas of the ventricles, which is, um, can be a sign that they had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, you look for calcifications in the brain, because the calcification can represent a calcified wall of an aneurysm. Even though you don't see the aneurysm itself, you see the calcium on the CT scan. Uh, you can look at the blood pattern. Where is the blood in the subarachnoid space? And that can give you an idea of what, where the aneurysm is that bled. In general, the blood is densest near where the aneurysm bled. Sometimes it's, you can't tell, but sometimes you can. Um, and again, the hydrocephalus, about 15 to 20 percent of people will have hydrocephalus if they had subarachnoid hemorrhage. So if the CT is positive, you hear about lumbar puncture, everybody says, oh, they need a lumbar puncture. They don't. If the CT is positive, you don't need to do a lumbar puncture. You already made the diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage. There's no reason they didn't do a lumbar puncture. And the reason is you don't want to do a lumbar puncture. You don't have to because you're basically uncorking the pressure. So there's the pressure in the head is, high, is, is elevated somewhat because the aneurysm ruptured. And some of that pressure comes from the spinal fluid. And if you drain spinal fluid, out of the head, the pressure outside the aneurysm is going to drop. And that's holding the aneurysm kind of stable from not bleeding again. And that's called, the, so the transmural pressure, the pressure within the aneurysm across the wall of the aneurysm is going to go up. There will be more pressure now in the aneurysm and less outside the aneurysm because you drain spinal fluid. So by doing a lumbar puncture, you may increase the risk that the person is going to bleed again. So if the CT scan is positive, stop. You made the diagnosis, now you go on to arteriography. If the CT scan is negative, but, but the history is really good, like, you know what, I don't care if the CT scan shows, I think this person has an aneurysm. Whether it's an aneurysm that bled, and only a little bit bled, and the CT scan can't see it, or it's a suddenly the aneurysm enlarged a little bit, you wouldn't see any blood, then you might go on to a lumbar puncture and look and see if, the, um, if there's blood there. Or nowadays, we tend to just go right ahead and get imaging. If the story is good enough, just go get some pictures angiogram, CTA, MRA, and let's see if there's an aneurysm there. So I would say lumbar puncture is not used that commonly. It may be used in, in certain situations where um, we're suspicious about other things or, or we really want to confirm whether there, that there is an aneurysm, but we want to know if the aneurysm bled or not. Maybe a very small aneurysm, we want to know if it bled. If, you know, let's say it's the person's 80 years old. We really don't want to treat them for the aneurysm if you don't have to. So then we might do a lumbar puncture afterwards. If there's no blood, we might tell the family, look, it's a small aneurysm, it's got a low chance of bleeding, there's no evidence that it bled on the, by doing the lumbar puncture. We think that it's safer to do nothing. So it can help guide therapy. Um, we can look, at the, look at, the, at the quality of the blood. We can spin the blood down looking for blood pigments. 
that's basically done if we do a lumbar puncture to try to de decide whether or not the blood that's in the tubes that we drained came from the trauma of putting a needle in the back and, and just blood got into the needle, or whether this is blood that was there first and the needle is now extracting CSF with blood in it. And in that case, we're looking for pigments. Blood that sat in the CSF for a while has already broken down, and you, when you spin that blood down, you get rid of the red cells. The red cells travel to the periphery in the centrifuge, but the pigments remain. The pigments stay floating in the CSF, and you can measure those pigments. If that pigment is there, then you know that that blood was there way before you stuck a needle in. If, you, if, the, blood, if the CSF looks bloody, you spin it down, all the cells travel out to the bottom in the centrifuge, and now that fluid's evaluated is totally clear, then you know that's a that's blood that just got in there, didn't have a chance to break down, it's from the trauma of the tap, and it's a traumatic tap. MRI generally not useful within the first 24 hours to look for subarachnoid hemorrhage because it doesn't pick up blood in, as well acutely as a CT scan. It is useful if you want to look for an aneurysm itself by doing an MRA, but you wouldn't use an MRI, MRI as your first round uh, as your as your first line of, of imaging because the um, uh, because it's not going to be very good at looking for blood. Um, if it's suspected, um, we uh, we either do a CTA, MRA, or usually nowadays just go to right to uh, arteriography um, because if they do have one, we can treat it at the time they're having the arteriogram. Um, these other, other roots are, are advantageous because they're less, they're not invasive, we don't have to stick a needle in, they're, they're less expensive. Um, arteriography itself, just putting a catheter in and, look, and looking in the blood vessels has less than a 1% complication rate, so it's still a very safe procedure. So the rules to remember as a, just as a practitioner, okay? A sudden severe headache is an aneurysm until proven otherwise, okay? You should have a very high, if you don't want to get sued, and you don't want to lose your suit, you should have a very high suspicion for an aneurysm. Um, a sudden severe headache is aneurysmal even when a CT scan is negative and an LP is negative because it can be due to aneurysm enlargement. Okay, So it really is a, is a diagnosis based on, on, a, on a history. A negative CT or an MRA in the face of a good history must be followed by a catheter arteriogram. Once again, it, it, um, CT and MRA is not as sensitive for aneurysms as catheter arteriography is. So if, if you still suspect it, go get the arteriogram. A negative arteriogram is only negative when you can when, when the radiologist says they've seen all the vessels in the head. Okay. It's also only negative when there's in the presence of subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's only negative when um, there is no spasm on the blood vessel. Okay, if, if the blood vessels have spasm in them, they're narrowed from the irritation of the blood around them. There may not be enough blood traveling through the blood vessels to allow contrast to show the aneurysm. So that, that's, that angiogram needs to be repeated when the blood vessels are of normal caliber. Okay, um, and even a negative arteriogram generally is repeated 7 to 14 days later to make sure that you didn't miss it. If you get two negative arteriograms, um, then uh, the person generally, and you don't see an aneurysm, they bled from, for some other reason, and you can comfortably tell them the chance you're going to bleed again over your lifetime is less than 1%. Okay, inpatient and management. If you have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, get admitted to the ICU. Invasive monitoring for fragile patients, central venous lines for, for bad grade patients. Ventriculosity for those with hydrocephalus, um, especially if the hydrocephalus is symptomatic. Blood pressure monitoring. We give nemotipine to patients. Um, that I uh, will talk about that in a little bit um, to reduce, not, doesn't reduce basal spasm. Nemotipine is a calcium channel blocker, but what it does do is it, in people that develop basal spasm, they have better outcomes if they've been on nemotipine than if they have not been on nemotipine. We obviously want to keep them hydrated. We don't want them straining when they go to the bathroom. We give them stool softeners, pain control, and we want to, again, do serial neurologic exams. We want to, we want to find out the patient that's getting worse. Usually what they get worse from is one or two, one of two things, either the aneurysm ruptures again, which is pretty dramatic in their exam, or they're developing hydrocephalus, they're getting sleepier and sleepier, then if they haven't been treated for their hydrocephalus, that's a sign that they do have it and they may need to have a ventriculostomy placed. Okay, why, is, why do we treat this as a semi-emergency? Why do we try to treat this within the first 24 hours? 
And the reason is, is because we don't want the aneurysm to re-bleed. We can't necessarily make them any better for the bleed that they had. We can support them and nurse them through it and, we, and prevent secondary problems like hydrocephalus, cardiac infarction, things like that. But what we want to do is we don't want the aneurysm to bleed again because every time it bleeds, there's a 60 to 70 percent chance of taking your life. If you're lucky enough to survive the first bleed, you don't want to play the, play the cards that you're going to be lucky enough to supply, survive the next bleed and the bleed after that. Within the first 24 hours of an aneurysm bleeding, there's a 4 percent chance it's going to bleed again. Each day after that, for the next 13 days, is 1.5 percent. So within the first two weeks, there's a 20 percent chance that that aneurysm is going to re-bleed if it's bled on you once. And in the first six months, the chance that it's going to bleed is 50 percent, that it's going to re-bleed is 50 percent. So that's why we want to get this thing fixed as quickly as possible. Some people say after six months, it goes back to the the annual re-bleed rate of an unruptured aneurysm of about 1% per year. Some people say it's 4% a year. It's really not, not clearly known. But we do know that you want to get these treated quickly if you can. Um, we, in patients who are hunt and nest grade 1 to 3, we generally treat those people within the first 24 to 48 hours. Their mortality rate is about 20%. Um, their major cause of death is re-bleeding. That's why we want to treat them so they don't re-bleed. But you can see, 80% of them will survive. Of those that survived to reach treatment will survive, okay? Patients that have has four and five, it's unclear whether they should be treated because they, while you can stop the aneurysm free from re-bleeding, the flip side is these patients very often don't do well just because of the effects of the bleed itself. The brain's already been damaged, and it doesn't matter that you got rid of the aneurysm. So many of these patients will put a ventriculostomy and see how they do. If they improve a little bit, then we'll go treat them. If they don't improve, we'll just let them watch them and see if they improve later. And then if they do show signs of improvement, we treat them. Um, vasospasm, complicated treatment. Vasospasm is the blood vessels narrowing because of the irritation of the blood in the subarachnoid space. There are lots of different theories as to why that happens, but it can cause strokes. And that's the other reason we want to treat people, because once we get them treated, we can raise their blood pressure to help treat the vasospasm if it develops to force more blood up into the brain. I'm not going to go through this. This is just about the timing. It basically shows for lower grades, earlier treatment is better than delayed treatment. What are the two treatments, coiling and, uh, and clipping? I'm going to show you the coiling at the end, but um, we can put coils in. We can use remodeling devices, which I'm going to show you. We use balloons. We can use other devices. We can inject liquids into the aneurysm and that harden when they hit blood. Like, so they, they go from a liquid to a paste. Um, and so there's a bunch of different ways we can treat aneurysms, endovascular. And as I said, about 85% of aneurysms, at least where I was before and, and the way we would do it now, are treated endovascularly. Uh, here's an example of a coiling. Here's a large aneurysm here. This is an ophthalmic segment aneurysm. Internal carotid artery comes up. This is where it branches into the anterior and the middle cerebral arteries. This is the ophthalmic artery going to the eye. This is an angled view. That's why it looks like it's going up to the side. And then here's a big sac that formed where the, this artery arose from here, and the flow is very turbulent. And here's the same view after it's treated with coils in it. Here's a, another large aneurysm, same location I just showed you, different aneurysm. Instead of putting coils in this aneurysm, we just put a device that's like a, like a stent, but it's almost covered, so blood can't get through it. And we laid it from here to here. And now blood has trouble getting into the sac. And you can see here it is before, and here it is afterwards. A little blood's still getting in, but if the person's lying on their back, it's just sitting there, layering in there. It's going to sit there, and that aneurysm will go on to thrombose on its own and just shrink down. And that's called a pipeline device. Here's an aneurysm where we, um, again, same location we, were talking, we I just showed you. And we're going to put some coils in this aneurysm, and then we're going to inject that putty that I told you about to seal the aneurysm up and fill. We only put a few coils in, not a dense coil, so then we injected putty in here. This is like rebar now. And then you inject, inject this stuff, it becomes like cement in here and just fills the, all the interstices and all the space in the aneurysm. I'll show you that at the end. Coiling versus clipping, you'll hear, well, what's better? Can you have your aneurysm clipped, open your head up, put a clip on it, or go off from the groin? used to be argued that, oh, you know, coiling won't last forever, it's, it's, you need to have it redone, et cetera, et cetera. The, all of the data that's come out in control studies has shown that coiling is safer than clipping for aneurysms that can be treated 
either way. So if they're if they're equivalent, you say I can clip that or I can coil it. Either way, it's safer. It's far safer to coil it. Even taking into consideration that when you coil an aneurysm, very often you have to go back and do it again later and put put some more coils in over time. Even when you add in those future procedures, it's still safer to coil an aneurysm and clip it. And this is the study that showed that. This is the initial study that showed coiling safer than clipping. Relative risk, relative difference is huge. 22% versus 7%. So a 16% 15% uh, uh, difference. 50% better for the coiling than the clipping, or you could say three times better. Okay, 7% to 22, so three times better for coiling and clipping. And then this study, this was the acute findings. Uh, um, this study, had, these patients have now been followed out many, many years, and that's where it's been shown that even going out many years, the patients have done better with the coiling and the clipping. So we don't have a lot of patients re-bleeding 10 years out. So it's not like they're doing great at six months, but at three years, they're all dying, and the ones that are clipped are alive. They're actually doing better out three months than the clippings did, and they're doing better acutely than the clippings did. And here's the here differences in outcomes. Death or dependence, coiling versus clipping, 30% clip were dead, or dependent versus 22% of, of coiled. Statistically significant mortality at one year, 105 out of 1070 versus 85 out of 1070. Re retreatment, retreatment rate is, rate is greater for coiling. We talked about that. Complete occlusion rate is greater for clipping. So completely getting rid of the aneurysm was greater for clipping. But even with that, the, the rupture rate, re-rupture rate was not significant. So the patients still did better with this. Because by clipping them and having to do all the stuff we have to do to clip them, they were, their brains were injured more often than with the coiling. And the incidence of seizures, which is a sign of manipulation of the brain, and therefore seizure activity is lower with the coiling because we're going up through the blood vessel. We don't have to move the, the parts of the brain aside to get to it. As I said, in terms of survival-free disability, outcomes from coiling are superior to outcomes from clipping, and no studies have refuted these findings for aneurysms that are equally amenable to clipping or coiling. And then these are the findings, randomized studies. I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, what, are the new, what are the new things that we're doing for coiling of aneurysms? Well, there are the, the, the devices get better and better as, as the years go on. So coils are softer, so there's less likely to rupture the aneurysm when you're treating it. There are coils that actually induce thrombus in the aneurysm or induce sealing off of the aneurysm. Um, there are coils that fit better in the aneurysms. There are wires that get up there more easily. There are, there are devices that help us treat wide neck aneurysms. I'm going to show you that at the end. And there are these liquids and balloons that we can use to treat patients. Um, Talked about what, what kills people. Talked about before, aneurysms kill people. They also um, can cause uh, significant morbidity. Uh, and what happened, why? Because they can re-rupture. You can get hydrocephalus. You can get infections from treatment or pneumonia from lying around in bed. Um, the initial brain injury, obviously, from when the aneurysm ruptures. You can get vasospasm from the blood irritating the blood vessels and causing strokes. You can, there's about a 20% incidence of cardiac ischemia when somebody has a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and there are sort of undefined things that can happen, plus the complications from the treatment itself. These are things that, that we've already talked about. We talked about hydrocephalus, vasospasm we talked about, which is the narrowing of the vessels. Whether you develop vasospasm or not in subsequent stroke, that relates to how much blood there is on your CT scan. The more blood there is on your CT scan at the time of rupture, the more likely it is that you're going to develop delayed vasospasm, narrowing of the blood vessels, and stroke. So I want to, we're running over time, so I just want to go here. Okay, um, this is important for those that are taking care of the patients on the floor. How do we detect that somebody's de maybe developing vasospasm? Because it doesn't develop right away. It generally develops between days 4 and 12 after a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, it may peak around the eighth day after subarachnoid hemorrhage, and it generally can occur up to 21 days after subarachnoid hemorrhage. The reason it doesn't start usually till day four is because the blood products that irritate the blood vessels that decrease nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator, um, those blood products don't become uh, available and exposed to the, to the 
uh, blood vessel wall until about four days out because the blood cells have to break down. So these poisons aren't made until about that day. But so what do you want to look for? Any change in exam, any worsening exam is vasospasm or hydrocephalus. Um, worsening headache is a sign of hydrocephalus. Altered level of consciousness, neck pain, fever. People can do the first sign of hydroce of of um, of vasospasm is an incre is increased uh, temperature um, and focal neurologic deficits. So this is why we talked last time. The, the clinical exam is so important. Somebody's Hunt and Hess score changes by a point um, on the floor. Um, somebody's GCS score changes on the floor by a point. Um, it's, it's a sign that we need to investigate to see whether they have spasm or hydrocephalus. Diagnosis is made in numerous different ways. It's made with CT, MR, angiography, blood flow studies. Treatment, if somebody has vasospasm, as we said before, if they came in um, within a uh, um, uh, if it came in, uh, what is I forget the day, is it within 96 hours of their subarachnoid hemorrhage, they're given nemotipine. Doesn't doesn't reduce the chance they're going to get vasospasm, but it does improve their outcome. Nobody knows why it improves their outcome. The theory is that either it dilates very small vessels that we can't see on an arteriogram, and that increases blood flow to the brain, although we can't measure it. And or it's also a free radical scavenger, and it may protect the brain by getting rid of free radicals. Um, so then, motopine is given prophylactically. If if somebody develops vasospasm, we do triple H therapy, hypertension, hypervolemia, um, and uh, hemodilution, make it so the blood can flow as easily as, as smoothly as possible and get blood to go and pump up into the brain. Um, Endovascular treatments, if they have severe spasm, we can go up with balloons like we do for the heart and dilate the blood vessels to increase the blood flow to the brain. Um, we want to avoid fevers in, in subarachnoid hemorrhage patients uh, because it makes the neurologic exam worse and it can make the, the neurologic function worse. So we're, we're very vigilant about aspirin afterwards, cooling blankets and other cooling devices like the cooling venous catheters. Cardiac abnormalities, I told you guys before, um, up to 31% of people have myocardial signs of myocardial ischemia after a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Nobody knows exactly why that happens. We've done lots of NIH research um, at our, my previous uh, at, at UPMC um, to look into that. But some of them have echocardiographic abnormalities. Very often these will normalize later, but it does affect their care in the ICU. They can be at risk for MI, pulmonary congestion, uh, things like that, and decreased perfusion of the brain if they have, if their ejection fraction is low. So having, having said that, I just want to, uh, we've got a second to show you, um, we'll close out with a movie. And then endovascular is coiling. Could you turn the lights down, if it's possible? Basilar apex aneurysm, Y stenting technique using two enterprise neck remodeling devices. So this is a more complicated case than what I showed February you February 2012. It runs the gamut of everything we talked about today. Surgeon and narrator, Dr. Michael Horowitz. Here we see a basilar apex aneurysm that is wide net. Here's the neck. See how it's almost one to one. The, the arrow outlines here. the bilobed aneurysm. So that would be a poor fundus to neck ratio. And then points to the wide so neck of the aneurysm. Because the coils don't want to coils stay will not aneurysm. stay in this aneurysm without using neck remodeling devices or balloons. The coils in here that just fall right out. This is a subtracted right. view. Here we see our first wire being advanced with a catheter being advanced over it catheter into the wide. basilar artery. This will then be advanced into the left posterior cerebral artery. So here's our catheter coming up the basilar. This is about a three millimeter vessel. This is about a two. The catheter is advanced. The catheter goes there. And the micro wire is removed. So we want to put devices up that hold, the, that allow the coils to stay in the aneurysm, and keep these blood vessels open. This is a ruptured aneurysm. Now a second rapid transit catheter over a headline of 12 wire will be advanced into the basilar artery. The wire will be directed out into the right posterior cerebral artery, and then the catheter will be advanced into the right posterior cerebral artery. Or the catheter going up. 
Okay, the wire is advanced out into the right posterior cerebral artery. So as it takes some work to get them up. The second catheter is now advanced over the second wire so now into the right catheters. posterior cerebral artery. One here coming up. We now have two catheters in the basilar artery, one of which extends into the left posterior cerebral artery, and the other of which extends into the right posterior cerebral artery. This aneurysm is right in the center of your We will now advance a third microcatheter, an echelon 10 microcatheter over an expedient 10 wire into the aneurysm itself. And this aneurysm has two sacs. The wire is placed into I told you about before. This the fundus is the body of the aneurysm. Because it has these and the catheter is gently advanced over the wire into the aneurysm. It is through this third catheter that we will deliver our platinum coils. The delivery wire is removed and the catheter is positioned within the aneurysm. Here a run shows all catheters in position. The first enterprise neck remodeling device, or stent, is being advanced into the right posterior cerebral artery through the catheter. So the stent right so that here part of the stent to here. lies within the posterior cerebral artery on the right side, and part of it lies within the basilar artery. I misspoke. From here to here is this one stent. Okay? And it's in the catheter now. We'll pull this catheter back, and the stent will pop open from, and run from here to here and be deposited there. A second neck remodeling device is advanced into the catheter that sits in the left posterior cerebral artery. We now have our two stents in position. They're not released yet. They're a coil is advanced into the aneurysm to hold the microcatheter in position. This anchors the microcatheter as we manipulate the neck remodeling devices. The first neck remodeling device in the, the right posterior back. cerebral artery That's going to pop is now being right unsheathed here. and released so that it lies there. partially within the right posterior cerebral artery and partially within the basilar artery. These dots here represent one end of the stent. And it has been completely there, deployed. So it's a tube running from here to here, but it's got holes in it so blood can flow. The second neck remodeling device is now deployed from the catheter so that it lies partially within the basilar artery as well and partially within the left posterior cerebral artery. This is our wide stenting configuration. These stents themselves kiss one another within the basilar artery, which they share. So we've stent here, here we here. are now advancing a different coil as we want to downsize for the previous one. The coil is advanced through the microcatheter into the aneurysm and the two neck remodeling devices keep the basilar artery and the posterior cerebral arteries patent. You can see how where the stents are keeping the dome is straight overlies the branch. Otherwise, the, the coil would have fallen from the cerebral right. arteries. It's it's so it appears area, that there is coil actually within the basilar artery itself, but in fact, it is held out of the basilar artery lumen and the posterior cerebral artery lumens by the deployed neck remodeling devices. Here, additional coils are being placed within the aneurysm. This patient has been fully heparinized, and at the end of the case will be given Integralin, a potent platelet inhibitor, as well as Plavix and Aspirin, two other platelet inhibitors. So this is where we know what's this line goes across there. At the end of the procedure, we've advanced seven total coils. We can see the coil within the aneurysm and all vessels filling. Here is the aneurysm prior to treatment with its wide neck overlapping the basilar artery branch point. Here is the wide neck of the aneurysm. Here it is after treatment with a different view. 
while it looks as if coil is in the vessel, it in fact is in the fundus of the aneurysm that overlies the bifurcation of the vessel on this angiographic view. The neck remodeling devices keep all vessels open. There's one end of the neck remodeling device. Here we see the edges of the stents or neck remodeling devices. We're tracing the course of the neck remodeling devices in the vessels. This concludes the procedure. The patient was discharged the following day on Plavix for six months and aspirin for a lifetime. Integralin was given at the end of the case intravenously as a single bolus. Okay. You guys have any questions? Great. Yeah, oh. What's your thoughts on the magnesium drips for patients after Oh, yeah, that's going to answer your question. Yeah, we do use, um, in the units, we do give key patients on magnesium drips um, for, uh, you know, a week, 10 days, because we've, we've shown that that uh, does decrease the risk of, uh, of, um, of developing basal spasm as well. So but that would be a, just written as a med, just like the nemotivine. 